saw that uh, last week that when I, I asked, you know, when was the first communion? And, and there's different words for communion, by the way. You know, it's uh, the, the um, let me see, I've got some written down here for you. Um, it was communion, the, Lord, the table of the Lord, the Eucharist, which just means thanksgiving. Uh, a certain denomination uses that term. It's a, you're partaking of the Eucharist. Um, this, uh, the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Remembrance, and the first century church and second century called it the love feast. That's where you get the agape meal. Agape is the love of God. And so a, um, it's a love feast. And so the love of God. And um, we saw in Jude 12 that where there were people that did not, um, did not, uh, they, they were coming to church and it wasn't really to, to um, build, it wasn't to grow, it wasn't to help anybody. It was just for their own sakes. And they used their mouths to divide and bite and, and uh, d talk bad about the leadership and talk bad about folks. And, and um, Jude 12 says, these are spots in your love feast. He says, well, they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. And um, we see that it's, it's a love feast when we come together. It's a little more than just these two little, what they call, elements. And um, it's, it's coming together. So when I asked, you know, everyone, when was the first communion? Every, every Christian usually it's, will say, well, the Last Supper, when Jesus um, was in the upper room with the, his disciples. And, but actually, it was thousands of years before that. And we saw that when, when Abram, his name wasn't even changed to Abraham yet, Abram went out and because the, there was four kings that came in and invade them, invaded the valley of Sodom and Gomorrah there's five, where there's five different nations there, five different tribes there, and um, uh, two being Sodom and Gomorrah. And the four uh, kings that came in with their armies, they whooped up on the, the kings of the valley those five kings and they turned their tails and ran well the kings went in and robbed and pillaged their cities then and um, and their countries and they they not only took uh, wealth of the place but they took the people as servants and slaves and and um, one was Lot who is the nephew of Abram and his wife and, and wife and his family and uh, and so Abram uh, he was he was upset about that, obviously, and he he talked to the Lord about it. The Lord says, "Go ahead, go for it. You'll overcome them." So Abram took 318 household servants after four armies, 318 servants after four armies, and he went out and he overcame them and he recouped all the wealth and all the people that were held hostage as slaves. And he comes back when, of course, the king of uh, Sodom comes out and says, "Hey, you can keep all the you can keep all the wealth. Just give me the people." And uh, so he was sort of negotiating a contract with them. He was there to do business, but there was somebody else that came out to to uh, visit him and welcome him back, and that was Melchizedek. And Melchizedek came out with bread and wine. He came out to just revive them. Here, here's bread and wine. Let's just sit down. Let's talk. Let's fellowship. There was no negotiating of any deal. It wasn't, it wasn't to do business. It was just to talk and to refresh a man and uh, 318 servants that just went out and battled against four armies. I, I, I'd be tuckered out, guys. I don't know about you all. I'd be tired. I, it'd, be, it'd be something of a great strain. It wasn't like they went there and all the armies just said, oh, Abram's here. Drop your weapons. They didn't do that. They fought against him, it said. And, and, and he overcame them. And so he comes back and Melchizedek comes and says, let's fellowship. And that was the first communion. And we've seen that it was the pre-incarnate Christ. Melchizedek being uh, king of uh, righteousness and king of Salem. Salem, and that was Jerusalem before the name was added to, uh, you know, uh, but uh, Salem comes from Shalom, meaning peace, and so he was the king of righteousness and the king of peace. 
And he was the high priest. Isn't that something? He was a king and a priest. Now, um, uh, under the law, that couldn't happen because the, um, uh, the, the priest came from the tribe of Levi. And the kings came from the, uh, uh, the tribe of Judah. And so you, it couldn't be together. But it was with Melchizedek. And then we looked in, in the book of Hebrews. And in, in looking in the, in the scriptures in Hebrews in the seventh chapter, of course the seventh chapter could be a seminar on its own, but it talks about Jesus uh, and Melchizedek. And so Melchizedek, it says, was without beginning, was without end, without father, without mother, was as the Son of God. And Jesus now is, he came saying, I'm this great high priest, I'm the king. And so he, was, he is priest and king. And so we see it was a pre-incarnate Christ, which we see during, throughout time, it happened uh, not not often but it happened on a throughout time on a regular basis throughout the old testament how jesus would come and he would help and he would do things and and it was all all of it wasn't just because gee i decided i'll help out the other times you know you can just forget you but w once in a while it, it says like with sodom and gomorrah and i use that as an example because it's really a very clear picture but he comes and he's and he's going to sodom and gomorrah and the valley and check out, but he stopped at eight with Abram first and to talk with him. And, he, and, and Abram asked him, what are you doing? And he said, well, I come to see if what I've heard about Sodom and Gomorrah is true. It, well, God has to come and see? He's everywhere. He knows everything. He sees everything, right? Why would he say, I came to see? And that word means, I came to experience I want to experience what, they're, what, they're, what the trouble is. And that's why Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus came into this world so he could be a faithful high priest being tempted in every way that we are. Right? So it wasn't, he didn't go to Sodom and Gomorrah and, and most people emphasize, yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah, sin pit, God's going to destroy him. He didn't want to. He didn't want to. But it was because of the rebellion against him that it had to end. There was, there was corruption of supernatural effort there. And that's, a, you know, that's a whole other you know, seminar to talk about. But that where if, if it was were allowed to go, we wouldn't have the human race as we know it. It would have corrupted and destroyed everyone on this planet. That's sort of like with uh, Ananias and Sapphira. You know, they, in the early church, they, they, they dropped dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, everyone, wow, you, you know, don't you lie. You, you're going to, God will kill you. And that's not true. That's not, that's not who God is. But the, their baby church, this infant church, had to be protected. It had to be. And so that was the deal. But so we see that the Lord came even with Sodom and Gomorrah, the pre-incarnate Christ. And so with this, this, this Melchizedek, um, we see that it was about coming in, this communion that he had with Abraham, and just fellowshipping. Hey, you're tired, you're worn out. Uh, let's talk. Let's revive. And I'm sure Abram must have told him all the exciting news of the victory. Amen? There must have been some great things that took place if 319 people overcame four armies. Right? There had to have been some phenomenal stuff going on there. And they talked about it. Abram gave testimony of the goodness of God, the greatness of God. And that's what we're to do. That's what communion's about, coming together, talking about the Lord, talking about His goodness, what He's done for us, how He's helped us, how He's been there for us. Isn't that all what we do to share our testimony, right? A lot of times, you know, people will share a testimony and other folks, oh, well, boy, they're just bragging. No, they're not. They're, yeah, on God. You, you, can't, you can't exaggerate God. It's impossible. The things that are impossible with men are possible with God. I'm not bragging on myself when, look what the Lord has done. Man. 
I mean, I was in Egypt. I, I was brought in by the secret police. I, you know, the police, were, um, because of uh, proselyting Muslims, I should have been dead. Me and the, the, the uh, young guy that was with me, um, and a lot of you know him because he came here, and now he's over in Manitowoc and married to one of the gals that were from our church here. But I, he got born again. I, I stayed with him and his parents. And then when they invited me into the, the um, Coptic church, which is the government-run church, and I shared the kingdom to them, man, hundreds and hundreds gave their life to Jesus Christ. The priest told me, he says, in the history of this, this church, which it's, you know, probably second, maybe third century tops church, he says, that's never had this many people, ever. The effect it had on, the, the, effect it had on, uh, uh, on the city of Suez was so profound that, I mean, I'd get a cab and they'd take me out in the desert and say, and I, at first I'd think, you know, no, what's going on now? They wouldn't even bring me close to where I wanted to go, but they'd bring me where nobody could see and they'd stop and say, what did you tell everyone? My, one man said, my nie I said, why? Well, my niece went there, and she's a different person. We don't know what happened to her, but she's not the same person anymore. I said, oh, she got born again. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. What did you tell her? I want to know. And shared the kingdom, and he got born again. His wife was in bed for two years because of her back. She couldn't even get out. And he told, I said, well, what, your wife, well, let's go pray for your wife. Well, you know, she's in bed. He told me, I said, well, let's pray for her. We prayed for her. And he came and visited me with her because she was in, healed. When we prayed for her, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. So they bring me in. And I said, well, wait a minute, guys. You know, you, um, I didn't do anything here. If they gave their life to Jesus Christ, that's between them and Jesus. Not me. I didn't do nothing. They said, well, what about him? Talking about Eddie, you know. And I said, well, if he did, wasn't there, I, I, I can't even move around town. I don't know Arabic. I said, he interpreted for me. And they said, oh, is that true? And they looked at him. He's white, just white, man. He understands what's going on. He's, it, it meant our lives. And he's white, and, and uh, I wasn't conscious of any fear at all. And so he, uh, he, uh, he said, they said, is that true? And he said, yes, I interpreted and so it was a small room, and there was only the doorway they brought us in, and there was another door in it, no windows or anything, no chairs, no tables, nothing, empty room. And they said, just a minute, and three guys walked off through that door, and I said, okay, let's leave. He said, we can't leave. I said, why not? There and there, there's the door out. We're out of here. And we walked out. I grabbed him by the arm, man. He was stiff as a board. I grabbed him by the arm. We walked out. From that time on, man, there was police all around me. And uh, people would walk up to me on the sidewalk and say, don't look at me. Don't look at me. What, do you, what are you telling people? What are you telling people? And I'd share the kingdom. Don't look at me. Don't, make sure you don't even look toward me. And I'd share Jesus. I'd go into a shop. They'd lock the door behind me and say, tell me what you're telling people. Share Jesus. They'd get and saved. Everyone ended up at the university in Cairo, talking with, and it's a, which is a, a medical college. I'm in the University of Cairo. They brought me there to speak to all the people that wanted to hear. Had over 250 physicians and come in and, and shared the kingdom with. Just phenomenal stuff. See, we have a hands-on relationship with God. Remember, see, God, when God created everything, he only used words, right? He spoke everything to existence, except for man. He said, let's make man in our image now and after our likeness. And then hands on, he sculpted, the greatest artist ever sculpted Adam, man. And he breathes into him the breath of life. He never did that to anything else. And if that's how he created us, that's what he wants with us. He wants to breathe life into us. He wants hands-on in our lives. He wants to be a part of you, what you're doing, how you are. He wants to be in, intimate in your life. 
And that's why when we say, Jesus, you know, I, I want to give my life to you, we literally get born again, never existed before. Ever. He takes our stony heart out of us, puts in a heart of flesh. He takes our spirit out and puts his in. There you go. And it isn't a bunch of rules and regulations then that we live by. He writes them in our hearts and in our minds. It's an intimate thing, and he wants us to be that way. And that was the first communion. It's Melchizedek sitting with Abraham, being intimate, talking, sharing. And that's what communion is. Not just a little juice and a little bread. It's way more than that. I mean, there's so much. It's about the body and blood of Jesus, yes. But there's a communion. That's why Jesus, in the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it and handed it out to people. He took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. He says, here, drink all of it. This is my blood in the new co for the new covenant for your remission of your sins. But they sat around a table. They ate. They talked. It was fellowship. And that's the aspect, the very foundation of communion is our fellowship one with another in the love of God, in the goodness of God. How He wants to help you, care for you, be with you. And that's why we're to testify of Him. And we overcome the devil. We overcome Him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, not loving our lives under the death. We're just testifying to the kingdom, the goodness of God. And that's what we need to do when we come together. Amen? Amen? So, with that, um, we, I talked to you about, in, in, in Hebrews, about have, being cleansed from an evil conscience. And I talked to you about that word, um, uh, uh, soul, in the Hebrew. It's the word nephesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H, -E -E nephesh. What it means is it's an animal life. As far as kind of going, I told you, if you would give some words that would just describe in the Old Testament when it talked about the soul, it means going back and forth, going to and fro. It's, 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 it's trying to hold a cat when it doesn't want to be held. That's our souls. It's, it's, it's trying to get free, wanting to be free. Don't know how. In, life's in a mess, but we don't know how to get what we need, what we want. And when I got to that point in t teaching last week, the Lord said there these people need to be f have a clean conscience. They need to understand this and, and let me cleanse their conscience, teach on that. And so I'm not back in the old, you know, my series. I'm talking to you about communion yet in having a clean conscience. So in Psalms 23, verse 3, we'll start there. It says this, read it out loud with me. You all know the 23rd Psalm, right? The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters for his namesake. And here's the third verse. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. So here's David talking about restoring his soul. Most of the time when we talk about Psalm 23, it's at a funeral. You know, it's just this funeral scripture. And it's supposed to bring comfort, or, you know, to, to the folks that are there, I guess, you know. But it, it, I, if it works, it works. But it's really talking about our life right now in what God does and wants to do. Not about in the sweet by and by. N none of that. And here he says, he restores my soul. He restores this, this anxiety that we can't even explain to anybody. It's, it's not feeling right. And there's a lot of people that are born again that have that feeling. 
They've given their life to the Lord, but they still are not, there's something that I'm just, ugh, I'm not feeling right. There's something in me that I can't seem to deal with or get over. And that's what God wants to do for us. He doesn't expect us to do it, never did. In fact, we're going to see in some scriptures this morning that under the old covenant, it was impossible to, it's impossible for you to do it. So he does. Amen? See, to many Christians, what, what they were before they found Christ is it still dominates them after they come to Christ. <clears throat> what they were, what they've done, what they said, their life path, how it was, went through the swamp, you know, in the cesspool for a while. And they can't get over that when they come to Christ. It still seems to dominate them, that feeling, that anxiety, that, that wrong that, that was, was done. It rules their minds, and it shouldn't, because what it does, what that does is it keeps them from fellowshipping properly with God. In fact, people uh, even like that. Uh, if um, they come to church, they start hearing of the goodness of God, the presence of God comes, the, the, the Holy Spirit comes, and you're starting to experience and feel that, you know, that tangible presence, and, you know, and, and they want to run. They feel guilty before God. And they want to run. They feel safer in front of a bunch of people that are sinners or, you know, that don't know anything about God. They don't, have, they don't get that feeling. And then somehow we always attribute, they always want to attribute it to God. People like that will say, man, I'd go to church, but I don't want lightning to strike me. You know, I don't want the roof to cave in if I go. And they have that idea of guilt that they can't get away from. And so rather than growing closer to God and reaping the benefits of this greatest covenant that there ever will be, where everything that pertains unto life and godliness is just given to you, they run away from fellowshipping with God. He's come with the bread and the wine. That'd be like Abraham coming back and Melchizedek coming with the bread and the wine and say, well, let me just go suck up to so the king of Sodom here because you're making me feel uncomfortable, Melchizedek. Rather than just fellowshipping and talking. Yeah, it's rough out there. I'm weary. I'm, 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 I'm feeling tired. I don't like the expression of what I've gone through. I mean, I'm sure there was some good victories, but there had to be some grueling mess in them battles. Where is hell? And so people come into church, and that's what they'll feel. They don't want to press in. They don't, we all press in, Lord, just let them do this. There ain't no way. Huh? And the guilt, the feeling, that consciousness of sin causes them to really back away and they just sit there as a stone. I remember once <laughs> we were in a little Genes in Genesee building and there was a young couple that came in there. I think they just had one little baby at the time. All their kids are upgrown and out of college now. But um, they came into the church and the power of God was just phenomenal in that place. It only could fit maybe 40 people and we were at standing. People just standing and um, it was just a little, little room. And um, uh, all of the, the power of God was moving. I just said, come on up here. You know, I want to pray for you. There's, people, you're, there's some people here. You need deliverance, and God's going to just set you f free. And um, uh, they were, they, uh, when I prayed for the folks, I mean, they just were thrown. Just the power of God just threw them, and they fell down. And, uh, just it was just it was fun the presence of God is fun and so they they said they called up and said pastor would you and your wife come on over to dinner he said sure we'll come on over and talk and they they explained their experience at our church and they said man when the presence of God started moving uh, and and 
uh, we just ex we experience something we never experienced before, the presence of God. And so his wife looked at him and, and said, what's going on? He says, I don't know. And then something else was happening. She says, no, what's happening? He says, I don't know. Then all of a sudden I started praying for those people and they're just kind of thrown like rag dolls, just bam, bam, bam. And she looked at him and said, now what's happening? He says, I don't know, just don't move. <laughs> that was it. And so he explained, praise the Lord. You know, they were, they were scared. They, they, that, that's that consciousness that God wants to deliver us from. And so we talk to them about it. We explain things to them. They, they, end up, they get born again. The next week in church, they get, they get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they just, great, they just grew up and just that we're are doing wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But that's what we're talking about. See, the blood of Jesus just doesn't cleanse us from sin, but it purges our conscience of everything evil that we've ever done, everything evil that's ever been done to us. It, it's, it's a terrible thing. It, what, this evil that we've done in past and the evil that others have done to us in past causes shame. And God says, I'm going to bring a covenant that guarantees you free from that shame. It isn't just free from sin and you live in shame and be uncomfortable with your life all day long. That's not a relationship with God. He wants us open to fellowship, to testify of his goodness. And freedom, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. One of the most crippling conditions of any Christian is feeling guilt and shame. It's crippling. It's destroying a relationship with God that will allow all his goodness and all his, all his wonderful gifts all that he's died for, for us to come into our lives. And then we doubt him, we doubt his word, because, it, well, I don't experience that. It ain't happening with me. All because of guilt and shame. Speaking of the high priest, the Old Testament's performance and we'll look a little bit again at Melchizedek, but let's, let's look at this now in Hebrews, the ninth chapter and verse 9 through 10. Remember when I told you about a lot of the Old Testament now is types and shadows. It's talking to you about something, but it just doesn't sh give you detail. It's not an image of what it's reality. And so it's just a shadow. You can see my image, but you, it doesn't, say, doesn't show anything about me, my shadow. But when I step out of the, into the light, you can see who I really am, blah, blah, blah. And so a lot of the Old Testament was a type and a shadow of the, of the kingdom of God, of Jesus Christ, of how things were to be, how things are supposed to be. And then when Jesus came, it, it, he, he came you know, to reveal, he came to give light to show exactly who God is, how the kingdom works, right? People say, well, God made me sick. Well, Jesus never made anyone sick. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, what, I, what he does, I do. What he says, I say. That's it. God doesn't do that. He heals. He's the healer. So all good and perfect things come down from heaven, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness, neither a shadow of turning. We can see it. We can know perfectly. Amen? That's why Moses came with the law, but Jesus came full of grace and truth. So in Hebrews 9, 9 through 10, he's going to talk about I mentioned that again because he's going to talk about this. He says it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who perform the service perfect. Remember, he's talking about the high, the high priest, right, in the Old Testament. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. It was impossible. Under Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, under the law, your conscience is going to cripple you. 
That's why some people say, well, we're saved by grace, and then they live by law, and their conscience is going to cripple them. We're saved by grace through faith, which isn't ours, the grace or the faith. It's a gift from God. It's just a gift here. Well, I have to have right fellowship in order to accept that. Otherwise, this guilty conscience is going to keep me from accepting what God has for my life. And that's what he's saying here. He says, cons he, says, uh, uh, he says these services that were performed couldn't perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of what? Reformation, or a better system, in other words. There was a reforming. And the only reason, it wasn't that, 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 that was, it, was, it was bad. The Bible says that the law is perfect and holy, but there's a, there's, there's a weakness to it. Where is that weakness? Where is the weakness of the law? Here am I. Look no further. He says, well, let's take that away. And let's bring another. The first represented Adam. That's who we're all born into this world under, Adam. We're in this imperfect, we can't perform it perfectly. There's no way. So he says, let's bring in a second Adam. Jesus Christ, this Melchizedek, the one that was born not as a Levi, even though he's a priest, but born under Judah. Here he is, the king of peace, the king of righteousness, in the flesh. Come to walk with us, be with us, explain to us, talk with us, take away the condemnation. It was a woman caught in adultery. They bring her to him. They didn't bring the guy. But they bring the woman to him and said, here, you know, this woman was caught in adultery. Now Moses' law says we're, we're supposed to stone her to death. He says, okay, he says, whoever's without sin, do it. Well, they left from the least to the greatest, right? They just left. Well, that, I, can't, I can't do that. He looks at her and says, where are your accusers? Where are those that condemn you, woman? She says, there are none, Lord. He says, neither do I. Go and, go and sin no more. He didn't say go ahead in that sin and it's all right because his, her conscience is going to keep giving her a issue. But he says he, that proved, I'm here to clear your conscience, woman. Amen? Oh, me? You ready for some freedom today? So here, we see this reformation is a better system under a new covenant, right? Let's look at Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. It says this, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, so here we saw it was symbolic, now it says it's a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. It's that the law is impossible. You can, you can say, well, I did the law. I'm doing the law perfectly. Well, it didn't make you perfect. It can't make you perfect. Only one thing can make you perfect. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. Letting him wash you. Amen. So he says this, um, again, he says, they offer these sacrifices continually year by year, but it can never make those uh, perfect, uh, um, it's the way I remember my mind. Perfect. For when they would, for, verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Are they being offered yet today? No, because they, they ceased when Jesus died on the cross and the veil of the temple was torn into. Saying, this is done away with now, guys. We're abolishing this system. Because uh, the, under Jesus, a new creation is coming into the earth. A Christian. One born again. A new creation is coming into this earth. And now there's a system for you that will keep you living as Melchizedek. And that's why in Romans 5, or Revelation 5, it said Jesus declared he made you a king and a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen? Amen? Amen. 
So he says here, for then, verse 2, for then they would not have ceased to be offered, for the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. There was the issue. It always was the issue. We're, we're doing this law. We're doing the sacrifices. We're, uh, you're bringing us the sheep and, and the little lamb, and we'll sacrifice it for you. But i got to tell you, it's covering your sin, but you're going to still feel guilty. You're still going to feel like a criminal. You're still going to feel like a liar. You're still going to think you're a no-good-for-nothing sinner. Because that sacrifice couldn't do anything about your conscience. Amen? So he said this, But in those sacrifices, the third verse, in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Look at Psalm 30. Are you getting this? So in Psalm 34, 22, it says, The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. Now here, I want, before I keep going on, i, I got to share this, that David actually um, uh, declared this when he, remember when he had to act nuts because King Abimelech, you know, he, he, he had to eat, he had to get taken care of, and so he goes uh, into the territory of King Abimelech. King Abimelech calls for him. He said, what in the world am I going to do? He's going to kill me. I'm his enemy. So he acts nuts. He acts like he's, uh, you know, uh, insane. And so Abimelech sends him away and says, get him out of here, get him away from me. And here, this is when he wrote, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants. Why would he say that? You ever have a problem? Maybe it was going to mean your life? Do you think you could sleep? How many ever had a problem and you couldn't sleep? There's only three, four of us in here. You others are super people, man. <laughs> Just super people. We got to hang around more. Every one of us, right? And so David writes, the Lord redeems the souls. He redeems the souls of his servants. He says, listen, he's taking away that feeling that causes you, like an animal, what am I going to do? What, what, what am, how am I going to deal with this? What, what's going to happen? I don't know. This is just bad. This is, I don't know what I'm going to do. That feeling of shame, guilt, in a, in a, in a, caught between a rock and a hard place. Remember that saying? The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be what? Condemned. That sense of, I'm not right. I'm no good. I can't do anything right. Oh, Oh, what a goose I am, right? Look at Hebrews 9 now, 11 through 14. It says this, When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. So he, he, he actually went into the heavenly tabernacle and gave sacrifice, right? That's why when he first rose from the, from the grave on that, that morning, he tells the people, don't touch me. I've not yet ascended to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Don't touch me. I gotta, I'm a pure sacrifice. I'm just coming here to show you, cheer up. I'm alive. But I'm going to heaven right now, and I'm gonna, my blood has to be put on, this, on the altar of heaven to purify forever because he's Melchizedek. And so, when he comes back then to the earth to walk the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, remember doing in, in, just infallible proofs, just incredible miracles. He says, now you can touch me. He says, put your hand, finger in my hand. Put your hand in my side. He says, does a, does a ghost have flesh and bone? He didn't say flesh and blood. Why? His blood was poured out in the heavens. He didn't have any. The blood was given. Cleansing. It was shed here in the earth. It was also poured out then in the heavens. And so here, he says this. He says he, he, he's, he's part of a, he, a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. 
Uh, that's to say, not a part of this creation. 12th verse, look at it. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. Do you see that? Having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremonial unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more? They're just outwardly clean, clean right? Inside their conscience, that, nothing could deal with that. He says, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, read it with me, cleanse your conscience. That cleanses now our consciences from acts that lead to death or sinful deeds. It doesn't matter if you did it or somebody did it to you. It makes you feel yuck. How many has ever been stolen from? It just gives you a sinking feeling inside, just a yuck. It's, it, your conscience has been dealt with by an act of unrighteousness. doesn't matter if you did it or someone else does it. That's why people that maybe they're sexually molested as little children, they have such a terrible struggle through life because of their consciences. Or maybe they were abused, physically abused, and hurt bad by parents or people that they trusted, an aunt, an uncle, something, a teacher, and they really trusted them. Maybe a teacher they really trusted told them that there's 57 genders and you can be a cat and a dog if you want to. You know, that's, that's evil. And it's searing their conscience. It's causing a problem that they'll never get out of, and the devil knows that. He says, I'll get to their consciences. And I can hold them in bondage all their life. And even if they get born again, I'll keep them from everything that God wanted for their life. By their conscience. But there's good news. Jesus' blood can, will clean us, cleanse us from an evil conscience. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the new creation reality that God wants us to have. That's communion. Amen. He goes on to say this in John 4 and 24. He says this now. Oh, wait. No, no. He goes on to say this. Right, 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 right. I'm going to just read 14 again. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse your conscience from acts that leads to death or sinful deeds, so that we may, what? Serve the living God. We just really can serve him then. Not work for him. Serve him. Amen? We're not a slave. We're his child. And we can just, I'll do chores. What, what, what do we have to do in the kingdom to get this thing done? What, what, let's get this th thing done, Jesus. Let's wrap this up, man. Where we'll have just one-on-one -on -one perfect fellowship with you forever. But as a Christian, we can find that right now. And this is what, we, when we start experiencing this, we'll really want to tell other people about Jesus. Now, I'll, let me tell you about Jesus so you can come to a church. Let me tell you about Jesus so you can come to a different church. Amen. No. Let's get their conscience cleansed. Let's let them become brand new creations. Let's let them understand that their conscience can be cleansed so that they can just live this wonderful fellowship with God day by day by day. Don't ask God to come in agreement with a low opinion of your own life. He won't ever do that. He'll never do that. Well, we're supposed to be humble. A low opinion of who God created you be isn't humility. It's stupidity. Humility isn't thinking less of ourselves, even though we're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. But we're not gonna, we can't diminish what God has done for us who he created us to be, how we're new creations, it, 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 kings and priests in his courts. 
Our conscience has to be clean so we can truly stand in perfect fellowship with Him and then start doing big kingdom business. Amen. Just getting done what He needs done. Amen. Fear is manipulated into a position of controlling you by guilt and shame. And if you can live above guilt and shame, very rarely will you ever experience any fear. Why? Perfect love casts out all fear. Fear has torment, but perfect love casts that out. Amen? Amen. I was in, you know, I, I, I'm brought in by the secret police, and, you know, basically, uh, that's it. What I did was, in their, in their religion, and their government, is death. And boy, the Eddie, that young man that was with me, whew, he, I never seen anyone that scared my life. But yet I had no experience of fear. There was none. And we walked out, and that was it. And then you know some of the story. You know how, man, when I went back into the country, I, the, uh, I had some general meet me that was a Christian himself and said, whatever you need, I'll be here for you. Everywhere I went, there was military protecting, there was army, uh, there was policemen protecting. Look at John four twenty four. It says this: God is what? God is spirit. It says, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. So I'm not worshiping them under an unclean conscience, thinking I'm a nothing, a nobody, a no good. I'm a sinner. I'm not. Now, I'm not as good as God. My actions aren't as good as His, but my righteousness is His. Second right. yeah. Corinthians 5.21 He became sin for us so that we would be made the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And if you are born again, you've been made as righteous as God is righteous. Amen. You can't get any more right. There's the conscience he wants you to have. Are you going to do things that aren't, don't seem right? Yeah, of course you are. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to say something stupid. You're going to do something stupid. It's going to happen. You're not going to see eye to eye with people. You, you might even get crossways with some folk. All that stuff doesn't matter to God. Zero, zip, nada. What you have to focus on is your new creation in Christ. You have to worship him in spirit and in truth. You're not asking him, come on down to my level, God, because I'm thinking of myself so rotten and help me somehow. He did that already. Once for everybody. Amen. Amen. Once for everyone. He did that already. Yes. Now, he says, now you... You come, just draw near me, and I'll lift you up. Amen. You you start coming close. Let's fellowship together. Let's let's just have this fellowship together, and I'll exalt you. I'll lift you up. I'll empower you. I'll strengthen you. My life will flow into your life, a mighty river. Amen. Amen. There is a river whereof the streams will make glad the city of our God, the holy place of the. Tabernacle of the Most High. Until we accept what Jesus has done for us, we'll never feel worthy, ever. We'll never be able to receive everything he's done for us. All the goodness, all the great... Listen, there's, there's things that he wants to do for you and stuff he just wants to give you more than you want. And we just got to let them. And that comes by this fellowship communion. I can have two people sitting in my office. And they receive the same instruction. One can go on to become a great success. And even say, wow, you know, look at, I did what you said. The other person, they can fall on their head. Saying, man, I tried to do everything you said to do. And I just, nothing happened. I understood. At, the, at that time, I realized that it isn't really in what they're doing, it's what's in their minds and their hearts of who they believe they are. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
If you think you're a loser, that's as good as it gets for you. If you really think you're the, I'm born again child of Almighty God. I'm a king and a priest in his courts. He's made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Sky's the limit. Look at Hebrews 10, 11 through 14. We're almost done here. It says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Remember Jesus, though, when he offered his sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. But under this worldly method, it's again and again, he has to perform the same duties again and again, but it never takes away sin. But when this priest had offered for the first time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. You know, the only enemy that I know of is an evil conscience. People having an evil conscience. Feeling shame, guilt. That's an enemy to God. That's what it calls in Romans, Paul talks about your flesh. Your flesh is an enemy to God. That's that evil conscience. It's an enemy to God. He says, 14th verse, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect. Everyone say, he's made perfect. He's made perfect. By his blood. Forever those who are being made holy. You're perfect. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you're perfect. I don't think so. I don't, I don't see it. I still do this. I still do that. I'm constantly feeling the only problem is this evil conscience. But the blood of Jesus, when we have communion, do this in remembrance of me, he said. What? He cleanses your conscience. Do it in remembrance of me. Your conscience is clean. You're free from it. All the shame of the past. Doesn't matter who did anything to you. Doesn't matter what you've done. You're free. Your conscience is clear, clean by the blood of Jesus, not by reparations that you make. Not by you somehow making an atonement for yourself. It's just accepting what Jesus has done for you. He is Savior. He is the He is Redeemer. He is our righteous Lord. Amen. First John 3, 20 through 21. It says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. You have an evil conscience right now. Maybe there's condemnation in your life. God's greater. But you know, under the law, the sacrifice, the work that you can do isn't greater. No matter what you do, you, you'll still have that evil conscience. It'll gnaw away at you, eat at you. That's why people commit suicide. That's why relationships run amok and they, they, they just can't seem to be together. It's an evil conscience. You know here, again, let's come back to this place of uh, everything that was God created because of the fall of man became corrupted. But yet we look outside this morning and say, what a beautiful sunrise. It's corrupted. And all of creation, according to Romans 8, all of creation is waiting for the manifestation of who? Jesus? No, you, me, the sons of God. That they can be delivered from their corruption and bondage therein. You will look at a beautiful sunrise, a beautiful sunset in this corrupted world. That, can you imagine what creation was like if this is the corrupted version? But yet we'll look at it and say how beautiful it is. And then we'll look at our own life and say, what a mess. What? Or we'll look at somebody else and say, what a, what a mess they are. Look at how, man, they're just bad people. No. They're in bondage just like everyone that has not rightly applied the blood of Jesus Christ. Christian, non-Christian alike, without applying the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from an evil conscience. 
That's why I said in Zephaniah, we read it, the third chapter, remember? In that day of redemption, you'll see evil no more. But Jesus dancing over you, singing joyfully, expressing his love toward you, how his, his goodness toward you because he loves you that much. You're not the product of circumstances. You're, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a product of a new creation. A brand new creation never existed before. Oh, you wear the same pants, same shirt for a while. You know, you have the, you're, you, you know, it doesn't change your height, doesn't change your eye color. And a, a new creation, it changes your spirit, who you really are, the one that goes on forever. And if you allow that then, if you'll draw close, if you'll let his blood will cleanse you of an evil conscience, and it'll start lining up with the spirit, and it'll start walking away from the fleshly desires and lusts and issues and problems, and it isn't because of your great work. Even in the Old Testament, he says, it's not by might nor by power, says the Lord, but by my spirit. And yet they get born again. And the new covenant get born again and still, it's my effort, it's my work, it's what I do. i got to look right, i got to do right. You just got to have fellowship with God and let his blood cleanse you of an evil conscience and your life will change big time. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, read it out loud with me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, the word behold means to look and see. So it says old things have passed away. It's not talking about look at all the olds passing away. He says look at everything that's come new. Behold, all things become new. There's where our attention is to be given. Look at yourself as you would look at a sunset or a sunrise. Look at yourself as the wonder, fearfully, wonderfully made by God and now a new creation in Christ Jesus. No reason for an evil conscience. None. Let that be washed away. There's things that have been done to me and things that I've done I can't even remember anymore. As far as the east is from the west, he says, I want to remove that iniquity from you. But unless we allow our consciences to be washed and cleansed by the blood of Christ, you'll be in bed with it every night. Psalm 55 and 18, one last verse. Are you with me? Read it out loud. It says, He has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. He's redeemed my soul now in peace from that battle that was against me. With Abram, it was the battle he just had against the armies that came into Sodom and Gomorrah, the valley. And Melchizedek came to cleanse his soul, to wash him from all that battle. David said, he redeemed my soul from all the battle that was against me, all the evil people that were against me, all the problems that were against me. They're nothing. People that talk about issues, you know what they did, you know, and it's been 10 years, that's an evil conscience. You need to be washed of that. Thinking, you know what happened, or you know what I, I did, I just feel bad about it yet, and it was two years ago, or yesterday, last week. You need to be cleansed from an evil conscience. It's not begging God for forgiveness. He's forgiven you. It's letting him in fellowship cleanse you of that evil conscience, just like Melchizedek did to Abram. You getting it? Communion. So when we come together, Paul said that which... Go ahead, ushers. We're going to have communion. And of course, I'm, we're, I, I didn't make you my rapture soup but go ahead and we're going to have them come up and uh, they'll stand on both corners here the seats and you all come on up yourself 
and take a little bread and a little juice. It's just grape juice. And um, uh, we, we, we're going to do this together. Thank you, Jesus. While you're doing that, I want to read you a scripture. Hebrews. We've got to live in Hebrews, right? It just sort of come into my mind, the 10th chapter. And, and listen to this, just a couple verses. Starting in the seven, uh, 16th verse. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I'll write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. How many of your sins does God remember? None. None. Zero. Zip. And he says this, Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. I'm not begging God anything. There's no more offering for sin. I'm just accepting what he's done. 19th verse, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, 22nd verse, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, he's not talking about baptism here. He's really talking about just taking a bath. You ever been dirty and hot? Can you imagine Abram after fighting those four armies? Do you think he needed to take a bath? I'm thinking dirty, hot, sweaty, right? Desert, you know, kind of a thing. And, and so he's saying, he says, have your hearts sprinkled or your con your soul sprinkled from an evil conscience it's just like taking a bath after working hard all day sweating dirty and you take a bath how good that feels to be clean he says have your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience how good that's going to feel for you he says this, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he's faithful that promise, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, testifying of God's goodness. 25th verse, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as we see the day approaching. In other words, coming together more and more in communion, in fellowship, reassuring one another, encouraging one another, loving good works. You know, listen, you, you, if, you, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you need to. I don't care where you are in the world watching right now. It doesn't matter where you are over our radio station here listening in the community, whether you're right here in this auditorium. Listen, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today's the day, now's the time. You don't know what's going to what happen the rest of the day. Now's the time to get your life right with God. If you're in here, and you need the Lord, let's pray. If you're out there and you need the Lord, listen, let's pray. Today's the day. Let's all really loud just say it. All these folks that are watch, watching and listening somewhere else, they'll hear you. So let's go ahead and just say, God, forgive me of all of my sins. I know that Jesus died for me. And I receive my salvation. Jesus. Give me a new heart. Put your spirit in me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'm now born again, a child of Almighty God. And Heavenly Father, right now I accept the blood of Jesus to wash me and cleanse me from every feeling of condemnation and every sense of guilt and unrighteousness. All the shame of the things that I've done and that have other people done to me, I walk now before you clean. 
as the blood of Jesus cleanses my soul, I'm justified and holy before you, Lord, by the blood of this king priest, Jesus Christ, who lives and abides forever. And in Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen and amen. Let's go ahead and partake.